Nicholas Kristof is perhaps one of the most influential journalists in the world. From the unspeakable horrors of the sex trade in Cambodia to genocide in Darfur, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times columnist travels the world telling stories of human suffering and bringing attention to the plight of often forgotten people. Nicholas Kristof has been called the moral conscience of modern journalism and the reporter who's done more than any other to change the world. In his new book, A Path Appears, Kristof shares stories about innovators who are using research, evidence-based strategies, and unique ideas to tackle problems in their communities and to make an impact in the world. And he outlines a roadmap for the rest of us on how we can each make a difference in the world. I recently sat down with Nicholas Kristof in Washington, D.C. to discuss his new book and the life lessons he's learned while giving voice to the voiceless. Talk to me about the title and how you arrived at it. So a path appears is from a Chinese saying that hope is like a path in the countryside. At first there is nothing, and then because people walk this way and uh, they walk this way again and again, a path appears. And it seemed to us to reflect both the fact that there is new evidence about what works to make a difference, and that one of those ways to make a difference is to provide hope. Let me ask you about this uh, lottery that uh, you were born on the West Coast, I was born on the West Coast. But if we were born on the West Coast of Liberia, our stories could be very, very different. And your story could have been very different too, which came across in the book, which I was kind of shocked. I didn't know this background story that yeah. somebody could write a little missive and it, makes, it, it determines it that you're sitting here. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we, so many successful people kind of pride themselves on the fact that they are there because of hard work and industry and you know, all that's true, but you're also there because of luck. And in my case, uh, my dad was a World War II refugee and he um, was in a concentration camp in Yugoslavia and uh, Yugoslavia was freeing some of these refugees and shooting others to try to be in the middle to plead both east, please both east and west. And a French diplomat wrote a brief letter inquiring about my dad and that was enough to, to lead him to be freed. And then an Oregon uh, family uh, agreed to sponsor my dad to come to the US and they didn't know anything. They hadn't even met him. Uh, their church, the Presbyterian Church, sponsored him even though he was a Catholic. And so they took a risk on him. And so he came out to the U.S. Uh, not speaking any English. And his first actually purchase in the U.S. was a Sunday edition of the New York Times, which is, uh, I don't know, there was something going on there. <laughs> he knew where you were headed, huh? Yeah. And I think one of the things that comes through with this note is that so many people think you have to pull out the checkbook and, and write a check. And yet you show time and again in this book that there's just different things that you can do along the way that can have a profound impact. Absolutely. And, and you know, volunteering is one great example that doesn't cost money and that is incredibly fulfilling because you see the product of your work or advocacy. You know, the people who most need help, they don't have voices. Other people, we have voices. And I've seen over and over again, people use their voices and advocate for policies that then lead to more services than you know, Bill Gates could ever afford. So uh, don't under, never underestimate the power of a few committed, well-educated people uh, pushing the levers of government to really make a difference. And the power of just one person, and there's so many stories in here, and of course we can't go over every chapter, then people wouldn't buy your book, and I don't want that <laughs> to happen. I want them to buy your book because it's fascinating and, and fantastic. But if you could, just share a few stories. One story, I shared it with my wife this morning, is Ollie Neal, this kid who stole the heart of a librarian and how she shaped his life. Tell the story. Yeah. So Ollie Neal is uh, this um, African-American kid growing up in rural Arkansas. Uh, very smart boy, but just a troublemaker. He's mouthing off to teachers. He makes this big-hearted librarian, Mrs. Grady, cry. Uh, he shoplifts from the store where he works, so he's fired from his job. He just looks like he's headed for trouble. And then one day, he's in Mrs. Grady's school library. He skipped class. He's in the library. And he sees this book by an African-American author, Frank Yerby, a novel. And it's got this um, uh, scantily clad woman on the cover, scantily clad by 1957 standards, which is, probably means she's pretty well dressed by today. <laughs> um, but it, the fact that it's kind of a risque cover sort of attracts his eye. And he looks at it and he thinks, oh, that, you know, that might be kind of fun to read. But he's a tough kid, Ollie is. And so he can't check out a book. You know, that's for wimps. 
And so he steals it, and he puts it under his jacket and walks out, and then he reads it and he finds it's really engaging. And so, I don't know, a week later he returns it, and he sees there in its place there is another book by Frank Yerby. So he steals that one too. And again, it's such a great book, it's riveting. So he returns it and he notices a book that he hadn't seen before also there in the place by Frank Yerby. He reads that and, and this happens one more time. And this leads him to become a reader, to channel his intelligence to uh, schoolwork. And he ends up reading a lot of other books, going to college, going to law school, becomes one of Arkansas's first African-American lawyers, becomes a leader in the civil rights movement, eventually a prosecutor and a judge. And so he's a hero from this little segregated school he went to. And at one of the reunions, he confesses to Mrs. Grady, you know, the reason that I managed to succeed is your library, but it's basically because I stole some of your books. And then she has a confession. She saw him steal that first book. And she was angry and she was going to confront him. You know, Ollie, you could just check it out. But then in a flash of insight, she understood that he didn't want to be seen checking out a book. And so she let him steal it. And then that weekend, she drove 70 miles to Memphis on her own dime to look and see if she could find another book for uh, Ollie Neal in case he liked the first one. She bought it. Uh, it took her several trips, several visits to several uh, used bookstores to find one. She paid for it herself and put it there. And she was so thrilled when he stole that second book, too. She knew she was getting through, and she did this two more times. And, you know, to me, it just underscores the idea that sometimes you, the way to bring about change is to take risks on people who maybe aren't angels and they don't always pay off. But sometimes you can really reach these people's souls and have this transformative impact. Uh, one of the guiding principles, as you well know, since it's you, uh, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Tell us how that became a part of developing this book. You know, so often we think that the losers from poverty are, or disadvantage are just those individuals. And obviously, you know, we know that there's tremendous inequity in the world and in the U.S. And uh, certainly it's heartbreaking that those people can't live up to their potential. But we also undermine the country as a whole when there are so many people who aren't able to live up to their potential because, you know, in some zip codes, if you're a boy of color, you're more likely to end up in prison than in college. And uh, we can do better than that. And, you know, I think that part of it is not just the technical interventions that will work, but part of it is kind of addressing the empathy gap in this country. We can do better than that. Uh, and, and the other issue is, what can I do? That seems to be a, a problem that a lot of people have. Is that what drove you to write the book? Yeah, I think there were two reasons, effectively, why Cheryl and I wrote the book. One is that there were so many people who were asking us, what can I do? And we think that there really are a lot of very specific interventions that are cost effective, um, that can address this kind of helplessness that so many people feel. And the other reason is that inequity uh, is a national issue, but so often we're trying to address it in ways that frankly haven't been very effective. And we think that the basic way of addressing inequality in this country or a starting point should be early interventions. And the one reason why we haven't had more success in spreading opportunity or in fighting inequality is that we don't start early enough. And you get so much more bang for the buck trying to, uh, bang for the buck trying to help a six month old than you do a 16 year old. Uh, one of the questions that came up earlier was, what can I do? Um, and it's almost a question that you at one point was asking because you ran into this barrier where you're writing all these stories and, and you, I, I've heard you say that you'd go into the coffee shop, somebody would come to one of yours and was like, oh, I can't read this, I'm going to work, it's too depressing. Um, talk to me about that journey that you took and how you approach journalism now as a result of that. Yeah. Um, so when I was writing about Darfur, I was very troubled that I was writing these columns and they just seemed to be sinking without a trace and didn't have the, uh, kind of as much impact. And meanwhile, at that very same time in New York, there was a, a red tailed hawk that had been kicked out of its nest. Uh, and New York was all up in arms about this homeless hawk. And I thought, how is it that I can generate as much outrage about hundreds of thousands of people being killed. And that led me to the work of uh, Paul Slovic, a social psychologist who has done a lot of work on what builds empathy. 
And in a nutshell, the lessons are twofold. One, that it's not um, numbers or rationality that creates empathy or makes us care. It's an individual story, and it's an emotional pathway. And uh, in fact, if you ask people to do math problems uh, first, then the rational part of the brain is more kind of exercise, and people are less empathetic. They're less willing to help. Uh, and the other component is that if you just talk about problems, then people think that it's kind of overwhelming and helpless, and they sort of tune out. So what you want to have is show a problem, but show also that there can be positive change if people try to help. And so indeed, so many of the stories in Half the Sky and in A Path Appears, you know, they, they plumb great depths, but they also show that there can be improvement, that there can be hope. And um, I, uh, you know, we hope that that will be a pathway to encourage a lot of people to actually do something after reading the book. And part of the book is the power of hope. So you know a little bit about the power of hope, but you also know about good and evil because you've seen both up close. Which one's more powerful? Which one's more prevalent, do you think? And does one exist without the other? People always think that I must be this deeply traumatized and depressed person because I cover genocide, sex trafficking, global poverty. And you and are. No, I am, I am the most optimistic person around. And you know, the reason is that here in the US, we're not so much tested. We don't, you know, we don't see the worst of humanity, but as a result, we sometimes don't see the best. In contrast, in Darfur, in Eastern Congo, in Syria, you see the worst of humanity and you see extraordinary evil but you also see people, you see the best of humanity, and invariably side by side with the worst, you see the best. I remember coming back one time from Eastern Congo, the, the most lethal conflict since World War II, and met a warlord who truly was evil, and he was murdering people and raping people, and he left a deep impression on me about the human capacity for evil. But on that same trip, I met this extraordinary Polish nun who had stayed behind when other aid workers fled, who was single-handedly feeding orphans, uh, trying to educate young people, negotiating with the warlord to keep him at bay, all with extraordinary grace and courage. And she left an even deeper impression on me uh, with her courage, with her altruism. So I managed to come back from Eastern Congo feeling better about humanity. Um, what about... Is there like a caring crisis? I mean, we hear so many stories of despair over and over and over again. And doesn't have that have kind of a numbing effect on people? And, and if it does, how do we turn that off and get back to the point where we're like you? I worry about that right now because I think that um, the U.S. has historically been somewhat insular. And then after 9-11, there was a period when we understood that the world really mattered to us and we became unusually um, attentive to global affairs. I think now a combination of time having moved on, uh, economic difficulties at home, and just a weariness with Afghanistan, with Iraq, with Syria, with world affairs has led us again to kind of pull back. And you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, the rest of the world matters a great deal to us. And I think that it's important that we continue to feel compassion and empathy for other people, um, whatever the color of their skin or the color of their passport. You've uh, inspired some criticism, though, as, as you well know. I mean, poverty porn, the white savior. I was reading some of these articles about you beforehand, and it's like he puts this on, check, check, check. Um, first of all, were you surprised at that? And secondly, do you think that there's, do you take a step back and say, well, maybe is there an argument to be made on the other side? Um, I think there is, uh, you know, a, an argument to be made. And I mean, one of the things that I worry about in particular um, is that I'm so focused on some of the crises in Africa that I risk leaving people, readers, with the impression that all of Africa is a mess. I mean, I tend to cover Sudan, Congo, Ebola, and um, it would be really unfortunate if the result is that people think that is representative of a continent and that you know, if they're less likely to travel, they're less likely to invest there. So I, I try periodically to you know, write about the hopeful side and the progress and the fact that seven out of the 10 most fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. But I still worry that I'm not getting that, that balance right. 
um, you know, on, um, I mean, I, I managed to get criticized for kind of anything and everything, and I'm in the business of dishing out criticism, so I think I have to be prepared to take it back, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have people um, criticize me, and I, you know, I read it, and, but I, I'm unpersuaded, I guess. It stings a little bit, though, doesn't it? You know, if you believe in what you do and believe that you're making a difference, um, then you've, you know, you have to be willing to shrug it off. One of the things I liked in your book is your honesty. You talk about three cups of tea and how you were excited about it, and then later you learn this other stuff about the charity. But it hasn't changed who you are, but that could change somebody who gives, that I yeah. gave to this charity, and then I found out this about it, and now I'm just not going to give. Right. So what should people be looking at when they're looking at philanthropy and what if they find out something like that? Obviously, it didn't deter you. You're still who you yeah. are. We don't give away money nearly as intelligently as we make it. And you know, I wish that we would put some of the same effort into it, which also probably means uh, donating to fewer organizations but larger amounts. Uh, and you know, also maybe volunteering for them or occasionally perhaps traveling and actually seeing their work, which can be an incredibly sort of empowering uh, experience. I, my, my family has always sponsored children um, uh, around the world through plan, the program PLAN and so I visited those kids and I took, uh, you know, I've taken my, my daughter on some of these trips and uh, I think it's had a powerful impact on her. When you go to bed at night, you close your eyes, I'm sure there are images or stories that stick with you uh, that you probably can't shake. Um, what are they and, and what kind of impact have they had on you and what kind of drive have they created in you, which I'm sure is translated in this book? There are some very scary experiences that seared me. Um, I, there was a, you know, there were experiences in Congo and Sudan, Darfur that um, were uh, personally, um, you know, very scary. And there are also people that I've seen that are hard to forget, which I think is why I go back again and again and write about them. When I first wrote about sex trafficking, I thought it was going to be, you know, one article once. And then I met, um, you know, 14 and 15 year old girl who were locked up in a brothel and were very much enslaved in that brothel. And if they had managed to run away, the police would have handed them right back, the corrupt police. Uh, and it was, it felt exactly like 19th century slavery, except these girls were going to be dead of AIDS in their 20s. And um, I had an afternoon with them, interviewed them. They were wonderful kids. And then walked out knowing that I had a great front page story and that they were going to be raped until they died. And um, it's hard just to, you know, forget about that and move on and then go back to writing about exchange rates or something. And so I think it's people like that. Those girls are dead by now. But it's people like that who live on in me and kind of impel me to kind of keep writing about some of these issues and try to give shine a light on people who can use that light and that maybe can make all the rest of us uncomfortable enough to try to make a difference. And so then the last question has to be the power of journalism. I mean, you must still believe in it. There's a lot of people who say, you know, it's this, this dying entity, but but there still is this power to be able to reach people through journalism. I think there is. I think it's a gatekeeper function. When I first became a, column, a columnist, I thought that I was going to be sort of changing minds. Uh, I thought, wow, what a power. And in fact, if I write about issues that are already on the agenda, if I write about President Obama or about gun control or abortion or about the Middle East, I change basically nobody's mind. Those who start out agreeing with me think I'm exactly right. Those who start out disagreeing with me think I'm completely preposterous. But where we do have a power as columnists or as journalists of any kind is in the uh, power to set an agenda, to shine a light on something and uh, propel it onto the agenda in ways that help create the first step to a solution. I think at the end of the day, we're not very good in the heating business, but we're just crucial in the lighting business. It's not the end of the day, but it's the end of the interview. Nicholas Kristof, thanks so much. Thank you.